Um, if we haven't inculcated a love of the game when they're young, then we're going to have problems later on. But yes, yeah, certainly if we if we're teaching kids what you had said, uh, Wally, if we're going to help kids at the age of 12, where the kid thinks I'm a star and I expect to have all this ice and I expect everything, and that's what's happening, then yeah, they grow up and they expect it because they, they've had it all the way along. So, you know, it's, it's a balancing act. It really is. Coaching is an art form and we've got to engage everyone and challenge everyone and, and um, <laughs> it's, it, it's, uh, it's an art form. That's all I can say about it. We've got a lot of minor hockey people on board. Uh, Al Ramsey, I'd like you to introduce yourself with Saul here. Al's in Massachusetts, and uh, he's uh, been brought up in a hockey world in Prince Edward Island with one of the best developmental programs, and now he's in uh, looking after minor hockey at uh, the U10 level or maybe lower in Massachusetts. Al, any comments? And please introduce yourself to Saul. Sure. Uh, so Saul, I'm, um, I guess, the hockey director for a youth hockey association. It's a nonprofit, town hockey, everything from house league to, you know, travel, 8U, 10U, 12U, 14U. Um, but I think, I think you really hit the nail on the head. I think it is important for them to learn to compete. I and mean, sometimes competing means you win, sometimes you lose. And I think we can start having, well, I don't think, I know, um, because we've seen it, but you can have those conversations with little kids. You just have to make it relatable and you have to make it so that, you know, it's, we're going to go out and we're going to do our best and we're going to compete and we're going to play hard. And sometimes we're going to win and we're going to feel great about that. And sometimes we're going to lose and it's not going to feel very good. Mm -hmm. And what do you do, right? Like you can either choose to, you know, get upset or be frustrated or angry um, or you can choose to learn from it and shake the other guy's hand or give him a high five and move on and come back and, you know, try to work on something in practice to make yourself better. Like we can have those conversations with kids that are four and five years old and we do. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I've seen it with other coaches as well. I think honestly, like I think there's other sports that do a much better job at that than, than I've seen in hockey. Like I've spoken a couple of times about, um, you know, my kids doing martial arts and I learned so much watching those guys that are black belts teaching little kids, like they're really, really, they're experts at that, right? Like they're totally experts at mindset, um, yeah. you know, bringing together groups of like four and five year old kids and sitting them down in a circle where they all sit up straight and they're all totally engaged and they're all listening to, you know, somebody talk about, you know, what it, you know, what does it mean to go against somebody and lose or get smacked in the face and it hurts a little bit, you know, and, and how do you handle that? How do you deal with that? How do you process it? Right. And how does that translate into, you know, how you carry yourself at school or, you know, with mom and dad or with your siblings or with your friends? And, you know, they do a really excellent job with that. So, you know, there's no reason why we can't do that with four and five year old kids right on up to junior level and beyond. So that's my I'd have I'd have a question for you. And that is with some of these travel teams, these are, you know, kids say, um, I don't know, 11, 12, 10, 11, 12 on travel teams that where the parents are paying significant amounts of money and some of these academy teams, it's the same. I think that that kind of creates a, a context that sort of breeds, well, I've invested all this and my kid should be getting more ice. What do you think about that? Well, I, I don't think you have to be in a, in a, you know, academy to experience that. I've seen that with, you know, just above house league, right? with the sea level team where you, you encounter that. So I think it's important to engage the parents so that they understand this. Like, you know, the, the tough part about what we do is that we're separated from the parents, right? We, there's literally like a wall of glass between us and the parents. They can't necessarily hear what we're saying to the kids. And, you know, they may not be in the dressing room when we're having these conversations, but, um, I'd say thank goodness to that. Yeah. In some cases, but, you know, there's yeah. a benefit, too. Like, I've been in other situations where you can hear the coach speaking and hear what he's saying, and the parents are, are aligned with the coach's yeah. message. So it's really important, I think, to have those conversations with parents. That's part of the parent meeting, right? Mm -hmm. and, and we do cover that. And we talk, we, we introduce these topics with the parents right from the very first day when the kids are on the ice. Um, 
we have that presentation. This is one of the elements that we talk about and we try to get it across. Now, it doesn't mean that it never pops up. You know, we've had instances where we've had to deal with parents through the season, uh, where we've had parent meetings midway through the season and we've had to readdress this kind of this the same topic. But, you know, the more you have those conversations, the better I think it gets. Sure. Yeah, sure. OK. I've got to move on to another meeting, Wally, if that's OK. No problem. I've got some questions for the people. Saul, thank you very much for thank coming you. on. Thanks for join, inviting me. Yeah, join Thanks. us again anytime, and uh, we'll appreciate having you on. And, and uh, I'm sure that whatever the topic is, and somebody will have a question because the area you're working in is more important than the technical side. And I'm really glad we're having these conversations at other levels. And I'm I'm looking forward to, you know, having you on again and f finding out more about some of those players growing up like Morris and wh <laughs> what they went through in the system back then to get to where they uh, did in their careers and now in their lives. So thanks very much, Saul. Thank you. Okay, bye -bye. take care. Okay. Al, thanks very much for that perspective. Um, I'm just blown away by Saul's uh, you know, his holistic approach in terms of seeing everything. I, you know, I initially, I have to admit, I was concerned that he had a pro hockey kind of connection, but I see a minor hockey connection that he's had to deal with where I'm glad to Al, you spoke and brought up. That's where we start dealing with those kinds of things. So, Sammy, have you got any Comments on what's transpired so far relative to your position in female hockey as a mom, manager, coach, whatever. Well, I just I love hearing from Dr. Miller anytime he has an opportunity to speak. Um, and I know that this conversation has sort of revolved around women's hockey. So thank you to the uh, men that are in minor uh in boys hockey that have appeased us for this conversation, but hopefully some of it has benefited. I think, um, you know, part of the conversations that I've been having over the last couple of days was um, to not think about gender as a, a male, female uh, construct, that it is fluid, right? So within every team you coach, there are, there's everybody on the spectrum. And that goes for both men's and women's hockey and being cognizant of that and you know treating the athlete as the individual that they are and not necessarily coming in with these preconceived notions about how you should coach men or how you should coach women um and so as much as it is difficult at times to coach uh what is perceived to be a woman's team i think uh for for men and for boys that are growing up that are maybe uh, fluidly more closer to the middle of the scale, it is tough for them to endure uh, what is perceived to be a men's hockey coach too. So being um, cognizant of that, I think that was really a point that we talked about the last month at this course that I'm taking in business is uh, we had a, it was ha half of the cohort was military. So um, my teammates were all ex Navy SEALs and Green Berets, which was incredible. I mean, it was an amazing, amazing experience. Um, and we had a presentation by a fighter pilot who was a woman. She talked a lot about grit and how she had to have this to overcome it and to persevere. Um, but some of the older women on the conversation talked about how we we also grew up with that mentality of chauvinism um, because it was ingrained in us. It was pushed on us that women couldn't do this. So we had to take on the male persona to be able to push forward. And that was perceived to be um, of value. And so in the women's game, uh, often we are judged, you know, beside our male cohorts and the ones that are sort of brought to the highest level are um, men that have perhaps played in, in or women that have played in men's sport or um, women that have coached in men's sport or, um, you know, the Jana Heffords of the world that simply played women's hockey are, are forgotten until um, it comes time to evaluate who goes into the Hockey Hall of Fame or somebody like Kim who has dedicated her life to coaching women um, doesn't get the same accolades 
that somebody that perhaps um, coaches a female that coaches men that is it makes headlines in uh, the newspapers but what Kim has done is to me far greater so I guess remembering that that flu that gender is fluid and that within both genders um, there is always a middle and two opposite ends of the spectrum so I love that uh, hearing from Saul and all of your conversation and so that's my two cents thanks Wally Sammy, I, uh, I I really go back to uh, my involvement with female hockey and accidentally falling into it, and uh, it's just in total keeping with, you know, the societal shift that's going on, and um, I think sports in general are a, an opportunity, not just with you know gender equality and recognition and respect. But the impact of sport and what it's intended to do is sort of what we're we're all here for. We want to make the game better and contribute to it. And I think um, everything that everybody's you know had to say has has been su super super good. So uh, Richard, I'm just curious about what's going through your mind and your role. And uh, I know you had mentioned something earlier that. Uh, had had come up uh, on a text and I mentioned Saul was on. Maybe you want to bring something up in that regard. It was, yeah, thanks. It was about uh, what the OMHA just put on its website about the role of a mentor. And I urge, rather than my telling everybody about it, you should have a look at the main page. Um, let me just get it on my iPad here. Um, if you go to um, omha.net, and on its main page, it's got uh, the, uh, um, the eight steps of coach selections, which, I mean, the topic itself is important, and, it's, and the content there is good, but it starts off with the association mentor position. And... I don't know who wrote that or came up with it with with the ideas, but what a mentor does and what a hockey director does, like what Kim is doing or what I'm doing, hockey director or technical coordinator, or whatever you want to call it, is very different from what the mentor does. They've got things like evaluating coaches and stuff like that, and it's completely wrong, completely wrong. Like I, I go back to the early days of. Hockey Canada's meetings on mentorship that I remember going with Paul Carson and all those guys and having these little breakout sessions about what mentoring is about, which I've known from the from the teaching world and from the coaching world, and having mentors evaluate coaches and sit in on coach interviews and picking coaches. Um, uh, it's not what not the message we should be sending at all. I have no idea where that came from. But it's you, you should look at it. Um, I mean, some of the stuff is is obviously valuable to associations about you know how to put together committees. But a mentor is, you know, uh, I'm going to go to Kim if I want to be mentored on how to run, you know, the kinds of things that she's doing with her with her uh, with her girls, and she could mentor me on how I should do it with the, you know my association. But I'm I'm not going to go evaluate Kim and. Kim, seven out of ten on that drill. Nah, you know. Okay, Kim, nine out of ten on that drill. Uh, that's so. Well, that's that, the business. That was, no. Sorry. The business of hockey is all about evaluation and results. That's uh, disconnect here rather than the process, and that's that's you know really the essence of it. That yeah. just trying to do things better and do it the right way for development in the long term. I think that's a big picture thinking, and uh, you know, I, you know, uh, I I can check it out, but I know what I'm going to see because it's typical of all the resources were provided in a piecemeal fashion, and until you deal with the the uh, base of why you're doing what you're doing, uh, you really don't know how you're going to do it, and they haven't figured that out. 
So it's the the values thing. Matt, very different topic. That's all. Yeah, Matt. Any anything from Saul's thoughts and Tom? Anybody else who hasn't had a chance to speak in? Bob, go ahead. Anybody? Yeah, I've chatted a couple times. I'll let someone else go if they want. I've always got thoughts. For those of you that don't know, Bob and I worked with Dave King in Japan many years ago, prior to Nagano, and we sort of had the same uh, Hockey Canada certification training development, uh, Richard, that you're familiar with, and we've been able to experience working with Dave, but Bob's, you know, coach major junior hockey and very high levels, but he really has a common philosophy uh, doing things the right way. Bob, any comments on everything you've heard? My my philosophy on, on like teaching kids to compete and to, and to grow within the game is like when they're younger, um, you just you have to let them play, but you have to let them uh, know that they have to give effort in order to be rewarded in ice time. I don't think that you have a kid play six minutes and another kid play 20 because he's a better player or a lesser player. I think they should all play as equal as possible, but there should be a set of guidelines set out early and, and reinforced through the year that effort is what rewards the ice time. W whether you play good or bad or indifferent if you're giving your best effort at your level then then you should be rewarded to play and that's how kids are going to learn to play the game and that's how they're going to learn some life skills and i uh, i maintain that any sport and and hockey is is actually a really good one is the best way for kids to learn life skills and i think as a coach you have to reinforce life skills in your teaching and and you I mean, as they get older, obviously, there's more things that you incorporate in there. You don't start talking to a, an eight-year-old kid about the relationships he's going to build with his boss when he goes to work, right? But you can when you're, you know, when you get into that 15, 16, 17-year-old group. You need to relate, like, teamwork and what it means in the work environment or what it means in a marriage or, or whatever. And, I, and I, I think that we don't – coaches go to the rink and they run drills. They don't correct. They don't reinforce. They don't use any of what they do as a teaching moment for life skills. And I think that, to me, is where most of our coaches are missing the boat. I mean, do I want to win? Yes. Do I enjoy losing? No. Um, do I celebrate losing? I'm not sure what you meant by that, Wally. I, I learn from losing. I don't know that I celebrate losing. I, I, you'd have to explain that to me a little bit. But I think we have to teach kids that, it's going to hurt when you lose and it's going to feel good when you win and you learn from winning and you learn from losing. And it's not always the outcome you want.
And with all that was going on behind the scenes that was affecting kids in a bad way. And, and uh, so it, it's something that does exist out there. And oh, it, it, it exists. Well, it, you know, you'll know who these two guys were because uh, you've been around them. But when I was coaching at the midget AAA level, the one parent problem I had was two parents that would be in the stands fighting amongst each other about whose kid was the better player. And this your son was being because I played them on the same line. Your son's selfish. He won't pass me to the puck. Your son's this. He won't do that. And it was it was so distracting to the team. I actually had the assistant coach take over the bench. This was in Maxwell Arena. I left the bench. I went up in the stands, and I told the parents. I said, you, you go to one end of the rink. You go to the other end of the rink. And if I see you two standing up here arguing the game, distracting our team, your two boys will be sent to the dressing room. That was the end of the parent problem. Yeah. Two best I, players, not only on our team, probably in the province. And their parents were just nuts. Yeah. Totally nuts. Well, I've seen, in female side, I've seen something not two dads bragging about their sons in the stands. But I've seen a player, female player, midget age player, say something I would never say to anybody, say to a coach in the dressing room. Uh, between periods of a game, disrespectful f feedback and behavior. So, you know, the, that, the reality of what you're saying, uh, Bob, if that happens in the guy side, but Sammy, it's happening in the girl side out in Calgary recently. So the, we may have our ducks in a row. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Kim may have hers in a row. But the hockey world, and uh, Al, you're trying to make sure your ducks stay in order in your environment. But you're going to be learning a lot moving forward as you go up the ladder. And I'm sure glad you are where you're at. Any, any observations, Al or Kim? Yeah, I, I had a, an observation on what Bob said is that I think that takes a tremendous amount of confidence as a coach to to stand up and do that. And I would do the same thing. And I'm not sure that the 13 years ago version of Kim would do the same thing. I think, unfortunately, as Richard alluded to earlier, with the amount of um, accepted movement in girls hockey, I do see a lot of coaches get held hostage by their best players and worried that if they don't... Um, cater to them in in some respect that that player will leave because again there's no um no residency rules and so i have seen that pattern uh not with myself personally but i have seen it with many coaches that they seem to have a different set of rules for the quote unquote best players uh because they don't want to lose them they don't care about the third liners if they go to another association big deal um but i do think sometimes coaches where you know, the velvet gloves with the players and the parents um, of the elite uh, because of that fear of them leaving or wanting to go somewhere else. Uh, so that that's more what I've seen here. But I, you know, to Bob's point, I would do the exact same thing. And I have done the exact same thing during a game. Um, and I've done it with my team during a game. I remember once we were playing a team that uh, in midget it was one of the teams that like cheered every time like someone on your team got hurt. Like that is lovely. And uh, we were playing them in playoffs and it was, you know, best of three game series and it was getting heated because they were, they, you know, were the association around the corner. And at the end of the second period, before we went out for the flood, the girls were jostling with each other and you could see them saying something or, you know, I don't know what was said because I don't, it's, I don't need to know exactly what was said. Uh, but I went into the room after I said, if you guys continue to like, if we continue to act like this, like, this is not how we act said if I see it again we'll we'll be leaving we'll just leave like you can't you can't act like that and they all looked at me like petrified I said if they want to do it they want to push you around and that's what it you know they want to be jerks like so be it but that's not the culture we're gonna have and apparently all these girls went I I have this reputation of giving rousing speeches I'm not sure where they come from but I gave this speech that 
kind of put them in line and the and the players were all telling their parents about it afterwards and because the parents of course are getting heated too in this tiny Toronto rink um but you have to be willing to stand up with the parents and you have to be willing to stand up with your players and and show them where the line is and we're not going over this line and I And I think it's very powerful there to use the word we and not you. Um, but but again, most coaches I see, especially the younger female coaches who haven't quite figured out how to deal with the players and the parents in a, in a group scenario, they just let the best players, quote unquote, run all over them. And I, and I think they run into huge issues because of that. Well, I'd like to re re relate a story to that. Um, if you give in to the demands of these players or you don't and they leave, are they not just going to run into the same problems down the road again with somebody else? So we had a player that we owned his rights. We wanted him to play for us. He made demands of me as to what he was going to do as a 16 year old. And I told him, no, he wasn't that he'd have to earn his way through the team. He was demanding to be a captain of the team at 16 coming into a team that I've got drafted NHL players on, and he was demanding to be the captain as a first-year 16-year-old. And I told him no, and I explained to him why not. Well, then he wanted to be the assistant captain. And I said no, and I explained to him why not. And I said, like, we always have a younger player as a captain, but he's a 17- or an 18-year-old, but he has to earn his way and his respect. Anyhow, long story short, he wouldn't come and play for us. We traded his rights to another team same problem there they didn't give in to his demand they traded his rights to a third team so he went and he played in the Alberta Junior Hockey League for a year and then he went to the third team that he got traded to um, didn't like that they didn't make him the captain halfway through the year like they kind of told him they would so he left and he ended up uh, going back to AJHL I think and then the next year he, he uh, played uh, no, I got this wrong. He went to college first. Didn't like what was happening at college, NC2A school. Left there, was, got drafted when he was there by an NHL team. Good player. You'd all know who he was if I told you who he was. Anyways, left there, went to junior. Uh, halfway through the junior year, decided to turn pro because they gave him a big signing bonus. He went, played on that contract. When that contract was up, he demanded another huge bonus which the team wouldn't give him, and he sat out for a year. He did have a decent career, but you've done nothing. This kid never learned from the time. And, and his dad, very wealthy man, I, I didn't understand the whole situation. I mean, the kid just went from one thing to the next, to the next, to the next. They demanded that the older brother play on a team who wasn't a very good player. It's just stuff that you can't give into. You have to be true to yourself, and you have to, you have to, um, what am I? word I'm trying to find here but like you, you can't you can't have these elite so-called so elite players deciding what they're going to do and when they're going to do it because it's the whole hockey program breaks down there yeah Bob I, I think we all understand that um, Daryl Sutter understands that Kim yeah. the idea of consistency and staying by your philosophy uh, is what we're talking about here. And it's got to do with parenting and education and establishing a standard of acceptable behavior. And I think, you know, that story, I, I could repeat two or three of them very similarly. Yep. And uh, Kim, I, I don't know at what point you realize you had to draw a line in the sand for accepting behavior not accepting behavior, but the line in the sand, and that's where if, if Saul was on, uh, in our conversation about Daryl Sutter, who he, initially in our conversation, he was a, he didn't quite get the positive messaging that I was having about Sutter and what he was doing because they hadn't won games. <laughs> they weren't getting results. <laughs> And I said, well, the point is, what was he trying to do is establish a culture that needs to exist to be successful. 
And if you renege on, on your standards of behavior and those coaches get fired sooner than later, mm -hmm. and it's because they, they want to keep their jobs, they give in, and so they tippy-toe around coaching ethics. And uh, in female hockey, in the, in the situations I've encountered, exactly that. Players demanded more ice time. And uh, the philosophy of everybody doing everything the first half and l earning your roles in the second, but having a role, which Saul mentioned, boy, that exists at the college level and should exist at the major junior level, not from the get-go. And what, that's what you were doing. When a 16-year-old come up to you and wants to be a captain, that problem occurred when he was in novice hockey. No doubt. Yeah. Al, what do you think moving forward? With uh, you going up to U10, U12s, you're faced with travel competition and recruiting now? Yeah, well, I don't know if I uh, don't know if I really fell in line with that. My uh, my recruiting philosophy was, well, we'll see who shows up at tryouts and we'll make them better. But I don't know if that's really recruiting. <laughs> no, I, I think um, I think this is a like this whole conversation today is really is a really important one. Right? Like I think we as coaches have a really, really important role to play. Probably now it's more important than it ever has been. Like I think uh, I don't know what the right way to say this is, but I some of the things that these kids are getting exposed to and like the way that things are dealt with in school and that today just like I can speak from our own experience here, you know, like there are if you have a birthday, for example, you can't invite anybody or you have to invite everybody because they don't want to hurt anybody's feelings, you know, and right. nobody gets a failing grade, right? They have, they don't even get numbers or, or letters. They get, you know, descriptions of like their performance, right? Like they're so scared to hurt people's feelings um, that they avoid the sandpaper or they avoid the difficult conversations, the things that make people uncomfortable, it seems. And on the other side, you have this ultra competitive, you know, stuff that's happening in youth sports where it's like to be as a good coach, you know, where you got to find the balance, right? Like you, you got to expose kids to things that are uncomfortable and difficult and help them try and navigate those things, teach them things, right? And you got to do it in a way that, you know, kids when they're little still get the chance to play. Uh, they get an opportunity to learn those lessons and they're not forced out and they learn to love it. Right. So it's like, from my perspective, we got a really, it's a difficult job and it's a, uh, it's a really, really important one right now. I really enjoyed this whole conversation. I think it's great. Is this one of the reasons why mental health issues are coming more to the fore than ever before? Because kids have never learned to deal with problems or disappointment or failure as a kid and then as you get to be teenage um, if we haven't in inculcated a love of the game when they're young then we're going to have problems later on but yes yeah, certainly if we if we're teaching kids what you had said uh, Wally if we're going to help kids at the age of 12 where the kid thinks I'm a star and I expect to have all this ice and I expect everything and that's what's happening then yeah they grow up and they expect it because they they've had it all the way along so you know it's it's a balancing act it really is coaching is an art form and we've got to engage everyone and challenge everyone and and um, <laughs> it's it, it's uh, it's an art form that's all I can say about it. 